Welcome, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's um, very, a very exciting moment today, the Illuminating Hidden Harvest, the IHH for short, initiative has been going on for more than four years. And today we're going to have a first look at some of the key results. As we wait for more people to join the webinar, let's watch a short video about the vital contributions of small scale fisheries. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of the Illuminating Hidden Harvest, the IHH team. Um, my name is uh, Lina Westlund and I work for the FEO Fisheries and Aquaculture Division and I'm also a member of the IHH team. Before we start uh, with the webinar proper, I'd like to say a few words uh, with regard to housekeeping. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we will uh, make this recording available afterwards on the FEO IHH website. And we will share a link to this website in the chat before we finish here today. Interpretation is available in Spanish and French. And uh, this can be selected uh, at the bottom bar on, on Zoom, where you see the little globe and it says interpretation. So please set that to the language that you prefer. You can also see in the bottom bar that we have a chat and a Q&A. Please share any general comments on the chat and specific questions in the Q&A. We will aim to address the questions in the Q&A session later, uh, or we may also try to reply to some of, of your comments and questions directly in the chat and Q&A. Um, for questions that we may not have time to get to, we will attempt to put together a Q&A Q Q document that will be posted on the website afterwards. Um, I would also like to kindly remind our panelists to mute their microphones when they are not speaking so that we have as little interference as possible. Also, in a virtual meeting, uh, audio quality may deteriorate unexpectedly. And um, if this happens and it becomes insufficient for interpretation, the interpreters will tell us so, and then they will resume interpretation as soon as the sound quality allows. So again, welcome to this webinar on Illuminating Hidden Harvest, IHH, a snapshot of key findings. Um, this webinar is organized in the context of the celebrations of the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, IAFA 2022, that was launched last Friday. The IHH initiative led by FEO, Duke University and World Fish, aims to generate and disseminate new evidence about the importance of small scale fisheries to inform policy and practice. The IHH initiative um, 
is inspired by the 2012 Hidden Harvest Report that some of you may know that was produced by the World Bank, FEO and World Fish. A major output of the initiative is a comprehensive report based on rigorous methodologies and novel analysis, complementing the great work on small scale fisheries already conducted by others. This report is due out early next year. Today at this event, we will take a sneak peek at some of the key findings of the study, but we will not go into details or recommendations. These you will have to wait for when they are presented in the final report next year. Now, before going into the technical presentations, I would like to invite colleagues from our partner organizations, Todd Steenman, the Stanback Dean of the Nicholas School of the <clears throat> sorry, of the Environment of Duke University, and then Garrett Johnston, Director General of Wordfish, to give the opening remarks. Thank you, Vera. For decades, researchers at Duke University and elsewhere have documented the rich diversity of aquatic food gathering activities in coastal and inland waters around the world. Aquatic environments connect families, households, communities. They shape biocultural landscapes, as well as the local and national economies in the process. Fishing is as old as humanity, and fish trade is one of the oldest forms of social exchange. Despite this richness and historical importance, the contributions of small scale fisheries remain dispersed, hidden and underappreciated by most of society. Their continued invisibility has important environmental justice, as well as ge gender inequity implications. For instance, the role of women in fishing is mostly invisible. The illuminating hidden harvest research initiative that is the partnership between Duke FAO and World Fish will add to the important work already being done by other research, research groups and practitioners. It will also help tilt the balance towards increased policy attention to the contributions that small scale fishers and fisher workers make to equitable and sustainable development. This new and improved knowledge on small scale fisheries will help decision makers to better include small scale fisheries in policy and actions so that their potential can be realized and contribute to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The Illuminating Hidden Harvest Initiative has so far involved 25 Duke students at various levels and capacities. Take, for example, the, the uh, postdoctoral associate Marmancha, who co led the methodological design, the training of country case study experts, and data compilation, among other key tasks, or Ben Siegelman who took on the role of acting project coordinator after graduating from our coastal environmental management program. Exposing students to multidisciplinary studies like IHH, addressing problems of societal and planetary concern, all of this prepares students to meet current and future environmental challenges, allowing them to connect science and policy. It's really amazing for me to see how our school can help accomplish this mission. So I want to thank you so very much for allowing us to be part of this incredible process. Good morning and good afternoon to all of you who have made the time to join us this afternoon. Learn more about the early results of the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study, an exciting and comprehensive piece of research to provide small scale fisheries the attention they deserve in terms of policies, investments and our collective actions. First, let me start by thanking all the small scale fishing community, civil society actors, scientists, policymakers and many partners at local and national levels, the FAO and Duke University as our co-leads in this study, for their immense effort, ideas, enthusiasm and proactive engagement in helping bring this important body of work to light. I will let the teams do the talking on the specific results and insights stemming from the study. However, an important outcome that has already emerged and one we should feel particularly proud about is the vast and diverse network of over 800 international experts across government agencies, 
academia, civil society, and local fishing communities across more than 50 countries. The Illuminating Hidden Harvest is already empowering this diverse constellation of actors to expand their partnerships and use this much needed evidence to advocate for better recognition of small scale fisheries as crucial to global food systems to provide fishers, fish workers, their champions and organizations, the evidence-based messages to advocate for human rights approaches to sustainable small scale fisheries. To date, research reveals that the contributions of the millions of women and men working in small scale fisheries helps FAO member countries mark progress, not only towards sustainable development goal 14 on life below water, but also scores progress on other important SDGs such as climate change, hunger and malnutrition, poverty, gender equality, fair work, human and environmental health. Illuminating Hidden Harvest is about making visible what has been invisible for, for so long. It's about shining the spotlight on the formidable force of small scale fishery sector. This study is quite timely, particularly in the light of the major COVID-19 disruptions on local and global food supply chains and people's livelihoods. Building forward a better future that is sustainable, resilient, inclusive and equitable must include support to small scale fisheries and the communities they depend on. Robust data and evidence like the one being discussed today is crucial also to guide the work of FEO member states in successfully implementing the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries. The 2022 International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, which FAO officially launched last week, provides a great opportunity for us to support, resource and expand this wonderful network beyond this study. To mobilize a global movement for transformational and meaningful change. We need to leverage the evidence we have generated and the collective power of our wonderful community to inform and complement the global call to action for a food systems transformation to healthier and sustainable diets with important small scale fisheries perspectives on food, nutrition, equity, social justice and environmental sustainability. To secure a strong voice and a seat at the table for representatives of small scale fisheries in important national, regional and global policy processes. To build a compelling business case for supporting a sector and recognizing its contribution to our global food systems and to argue that support for an investment in small scale fisheries is support for an investment in COVID-19 recovery solutions and climate action. I look forward to the webinar. Thank you, back to you, Len. Thank you very much, Todd and Garrett for those words. Um, the IHA study is a, a truly global effort. As um, Garrett mentioned, uh, more than 800 experts worldwide have contributed to, to the work and um, including the country case studies, thematic studies and reviewing the results. Um, let's uh, now watch a video to see some of these people who have contributed and learn a bit more about the IHH approach. The contribution of a small scale fishery uh, to sustainable development are uh, often undervalued or overlooked. This results in missed opportunities to progress the sustainable development goals. And in the worst instances, small scale fisher and fish workers experiencing increased marginalization. And exclusion from governance, spaces and resources. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or FAO, Duke University and the World Fish team up in 2017 to help address this issue. By launching the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Global Initiative. This initiative will help to further improve methods and capacities to collect, analyze, and use data in support of small-scale fisheries. As the basis for sound and inclusive policy making and resource governance. A major output of this initiative is a research report. That uses a multidisciplinary approach. To assess and broaden our understanding of the values of marine and inland small-scale fisheries globally. The report looks 
holistically at small scale fisheries and their contributions to the environment, livelihoods, and the well being, nutrition, households, and global economies, fisheries governance. Across all this, we paid particular attention to the role of women and the gender aspect of small scale fisheries. The Illuminating Hidden Harvest team developed a rigorous methodology. In-country experts used this methodology to look beyond official sources of fisheries data to collect and synthesize information about small-scale fisheries. For 58 country and territory case studies spanning Africa, Asia, Oceania, Europe, and the Americas. Countries were prioritized based on the importance of their fishery sector. In terms of employment, production, and nutrition. All researchers attended one-on-one -on -one training sessions on the Illuminating Hidden Harvest methodology. Covering data gathering, compilation, and documentation. A network of 28 gender advisors was engaged alongside some of the country teams. To ensure that women's contributions to small-scale fisheries were elevated in the research. The report consisted of other comprehensive data harvesting techniques, including a questionnaire responded to by 104 FAO member countries. A review of national data sets on labor force and household income and expenditure survey. And an assessment of fisheries policies and the FAO LEX database. We work with expert teams to highlight important themes. Shining the needed light on issues such as indigenous people and the importance of identity in understanding fishers and fish workers' choices. Thanks to the contribution of more than 800 experts. New and clear insights are coming to the surface. Adding to the growing body of evidence around small-scale fisheries. We will continue to develop new methods and capacities for better data collection in the future. That governments, researchers and others can apply and refine. Critically, the elimination hide and harvest uh, knowledge will support the implementation of the small scale fisheries guidelines. By providing key information to organizations and advocates. To make a strong case for productive, sustainable, and equitable small scale fisheries for all. After this um, introduction to the approach, um, we will now have uh, members of the IHH team present a handful of key findings from the forthcoming report. And I will start by handing over to Mar Mansha that will give us a bit of a deeper look at the approach and then she will be followed by the other team members. Uh, over to you, Mar, please. Thank you, Lena. My name is Maria del Mar Mancha Cisneros. I was a postdoctoral associate at Duke University and working as the technical lead for IHH. And I'm going to start this uh, presentation with an overview of the approach taken by the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study, or as we call it for short, IHH, recognizing small scale fisheries as complex socio ecological systems. IHH took a multidisciplinary approach which is closely embedded within the Sustainable Development Goals Framework, as we can see from the figure, as well as the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries, and particularly as a response to the call for better data within the small-scale fisheries guidelines. Particularly, IHH looks at the contributions of small-scale fisheries to the three pillars of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental with a strong focus on nutrition and governance, and with, the gen and with gender as a cross-cutting dimension. The main data source for the study was a series of 58 case studies that were carried out in the countries and territories you see highlighted in the map, which were selected according to a series of indicators and that accounted for 62% of global inland catch and 68% of global marine catch, according to FAO data. 
the country and territory case studies were carried out by national research institutes, fisheries organizations, local and international fisheries experts for a total of more than 800 contributors with the objective to compile available data and information on small scale fisheries at country level, including official statistics, surveys, and expert knowledge, following a standard protocol provided by the IHH team. Gender focal points were also identified within the countries to support the case studies experts on data collection to flush out all available data and knowledge on gender and small scale fisheries, including gender disaggregated data to estimate contributions by women and men in small scale fisheries. For example, in terms of fisheries labor and highlight specific gaps and limitations in the available data. Other data sources were used to complement and fill gaps and triangulate these country and territory case study data. And these were responses, including responses to an ad hoc questionnaire on small scale fisheries that was sent to FAO member countries and territories, and for which we received 104 responses, as well as other existing global and regional databases, literature reviews, labor force surveys, and household income and expenditure survey data. Finally, specific thematic studies were also carried out in order to highlight key aspects of small scale fisheries that cannot be quantified at global level. For example, a study on indigenous peoples and identity. As we all know, there is no internationally agreed definition of small scale fisheries. Therefore, the IHH study did not prescribe a definition for it. Instead, country case study experts were instructed to use the most commonly used definition for small scale fisheries in their country for data compilation. However, the IHH study did use a tool called the characterization matrix that allowed to score each fishery included in the study according to a series of characteristics such as gear used, motorization, distance from shore, et cetera. To place them along the continuum between small scale and large scale fisheries, and to give a better sense of what we are really looking at when we talk about small scale fisheries in the study. Finally, Data compiled through the different approaches were analyzed and extrapolated to produce global estimates of the key indicators, such as catch and employment, but also used to gain better insights on issues that are very important for small scale fisheries at different spatial scales, such as national or subnational levels. In addition to those aspects highlighted in the thematic studies that cannot be quantified at global level, yet recognizing the high diversity of small scale fisheries. We want to take the opportunity to thank the IHH technical advisory group listed here, who advised on the design analysis and interpretation throughout the way. As mentioned earlier, IHH took a multidisciplinary approach illustrated by this diagram and put a stress on the interconnections among the different dimensions and related questions in order to draw a holistic picture of small scale fisheries to highlight their overall contributions, benefits, and impacts, and by looking at the data through the lens of different disciplines at the same time. We will hear more details on the results of some of the analysis undertaken within the IHH study and the rest of the webinar. Starting with the first question, how much fish comes from small-scale fisheries? With this, I am going to leave the floor to Simon Finch smith for his presentation on harvesting and the environmental dimensions of the IHH study. Thank you, Mark. I'm Simon Funch Smith, and I work for FAO as a regional fishery officer in Asia, and I'm a core team member of the IHH initiative. Let's start by highlighting some key results on the harvesting and environmental dimensions of small scale fisheries. And particularly, we need to first understand what is the contribution of small scale fisheries to the global fisheries catch. In this bar, we see total global fisheries catch estimated by the IHH study with a total of 92.1 million tonnes, from which 40% or almost 37 million tonnes are coming from small scale fisheries or SSF, and 60% is from large scale fisheries, LSF. However, if we look at these patterns at a regional level, we see the share of small scale fisheries catch is highly variable across regions being highest in Africa and Asia with 66% and 47% respectively, and lowest in Europe 
with only 5% of total catches coming from the SSF sector. Now let's take a look at how small scale fisheries catches are distributed between marine and inland sector. At global level in our study, 68% of total catches come from marine small scale fisheries and the other 32% or one third come from inland small scale fisheries. When looking at regional patterns, almost half of the catch in Africa comes from the inland sector, highlighting the absolute importance of these fisheries for the continent. For the Americas, and intuitively in Oceania, the importance of the inland fishery sector in terms of catch volumes is low, between five and 10%. The next question is how are the different species groups represented in small scale fisheries catches? Identifying fisheries catch at the species or higher taxonomic levels has a positive impact in how these fisheries are monitored, assessed and managed. However, only 63% of marine small scale fisheries catches and 40% of small scale inland catches have been identified in our study at family levels. From this sample, carps, tilapia and small pelagic species dominated the inland reported catch. The generally poor quality of reporting at species level in inland fisheries severely limits deeper analysis of the resilience of inland fisheries and their economic and nutritional importance. For marine small scale fisheries, the most represented species groups included small pelagics, such as sardines, herrings, and anchovies, and other pelagic fish such as mackerels, scads, and tunas. These add up to almost 50% of the total marine small scale fisheries catch. As you will see in the following presentations, IHH is a lot more than understanding the catch contributions of small scale fisheries. The amount, quality and granularity of the information collected has allowed us to tackle many other questions to better understand the harvesting and environmental dimensions of small scale fisheries. For instance, we have data that allows us to disaggregate catches by species, gears, fleets and ecosystems. We also have information that can provide a global synthesis of small scale fisheries fleets, including catch efficiencies and the nature and scale of the operations. For example, crew size, distance from shore or fishing activities, as well as other aspects, such as the use of some sort of onboard refrigeration. We're also using available data and literature reviews to better understand small scale fisheries interactions in the environment. For example, detrimental effects to critical habitats, and the impacts of small scale fisheries on vulnerable species, including threatened species. We also shed some light into the impacts of climate change in small scale fisheries, including some policy recommendations on mitigation and adaptation strategies. So to come back to our initial question on how much fish comes from small scale fisheries, we found that 37 million tons or 40% of the global catch originates from small scale fisheries. Now, my colleague, Nicole will now look into the people behind this catch to better understand how many people depend on the small scale fisheries for their livelihoods. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Simon. I'm Nicole Franz. I lead the Equitable Livelihoods team in FAO's Fisheries and Aquaculture Division, and I'm a member of the IHH team. I'm presenting on behalf of other key members of the IHH team and other great contributors to this section. So how many people depend on those 40% of global catch for their livelihoods? Our estimates extrapolated from 78 national household based surveys show that 60 million people are employed part time or full time along the value chain in small scale fisheries. This confirms that small scale fisheries account for 90% of all of those employed in capture fisheries along the value chain. An additional 53 million people engage in subsistence fishing. This adds up to a total of 130 million people either employed in small scale fisheries along the value chain or engaged in subsistence activities. These 113 million people are estimated to have 379 million additional household members. So if we consider all those employed in small scale fisheries along the value chain in subsistence fisheries and their dependents, the number of those whose livelihoods are at least partially dependent upon small scale fisheries is 492 million people. 
This represents almost 7% of the world population in 2016, and over 13% of the population in least developed countries. And consider that the methodology based on national surveys is likely still hiding more people depending on small scale fisheries. So let's also look at what the total economic value of the 37 million tons of aquatic food produced by small scale fisheries is. We acknowledge that a broad multidimensional perspective on development is required, but we decided to use a socioeconomic indicator frequently used by governments in decision making to answer this question. We use total revenues from the first sale of catch as an initial indicator of this value. Based on our analysis, the average annual total revenues of small scale fisheries were estimated to be 77 billion US dollars. 58 billion US dollars of these are from marine small scale fisheries and 19 million US dollars are from inland small scale fisheries. This economic value of small scale fisheries production is significant. For the 58 IHH case study countries, small scale fisheries generated 44% of the average annual total revenues from the first sale of all fish catch. The estimated total revenues from the marine harvesting segment of small scale fisheries place small scale fisheries also among the largest industries in the ocean economy. There's of course more in the chapter. For example, IHH provides an attempt to push the boundaries of knowledge on the role of small scale fisheries in an increasingly globalized system of international trade by quantifying small scale fisheries exports for a number of countries. There are case studies on the nature of subsistence fishing, seasonality, and the role of small scale fisheries at subnational level. And the employment and subsistence data you saw is available broken down, for example, by value chain segment, by inland and marine fisheries, and by gender, as women play a key role in sustainable development. So now that we know the contribution of small scale fisheries to global catch, the number of people at least partially dependent on small scale fisheries. Let us hear more from our IHH colleague Danica about how women contribute to and benefit from small scale fisheries. Over to you, Danica. Hello, my name is Danica Kleiber and I'm the co-lead on the gender theme of Illuminating Hidden Harvest Initiative. And I'm presenting today on behalf of my amazing co-lead, Sarah Harper, and the many other wonderful people listed here who contributed their insights, knowledge, and expertise on gender and small-scale fisheries for this study. Small-scale fisheries cannot be understood without considering gender, and considering gender in this sector requires confronting the persistent absence of women in the already meager data available on small-scale fisheries. Uh, for example, Dr. Fakoya uh, let us know that in Nigeria, net making is considered an extension of women's reproductive or household activities and is therefore not included in census of fisheries employment. This quote highlights one of the numerous reasons for the persistent gender data gap in small scale fisheries. In this study, we set out to estimate the contributions by women and men to small scale fisheries and understand why gender disaggregated data and especially those data that highlight the contributions by women are so limited. However, due to the hard work of uh, this group, this initiative, were, uh, we were able to provide a more robust set of gender disaggregated data, which shows that an estimated 45 million women participate in small scale fisheries value chains globally, which represents 40% of the total estimated small scale fisheries labor. This means that for every 10 people that participate in small scale fisheries, four are women that are either working for pay or fishing or fishing for home consumption. Broken down by segments of the value chain or subsector, women represent just over 15% of pre-harvest labor, such as gear fabrication and repair, bait and ice provisioning and boat building. 19% of commercial harvest labor, including vessel and non-vessel based activities, um, and by contrast, women represent half of all of those engaged in the post-harvest sector. This includes processing, transporting, trading, selling, and other activities, and 45% of subsistence fisheries laborers. 
Other highlights from this chapter informed by diverse data and knowledge sources include that women are overrepresented in rarely accounted for fisheries labor, especially informal and unpaid activities, including subsistence fishing, such as gleaning, and informal activities that support fishing businesses and operations. While women participate in small scale fisheries in substantial numbers, they are underrepresented in governance arenas and face significant barriers to meaningful participation in management and decision making. And finally, in many contexts, women, and especially certain groups of women, have less access to but stand to disproportionately benefit from small scale fisheries, especially income and, and nutrition related benefits. In the next presentation, we will hear more highlights from the IHH on the distribution of nutrition related benefits of small scale fisheries, including those that relate to gender. Now that we have highlighted the substantial labor contributions by women to small scale fisheries, I'm going to give the floor to my colleague David Mills for his presentation on nutrition and small scale fisheries that address the key question, how is small scale fisheries catch important to nutrition? Thank you, Danica, and hello everyone. Uh, my name is David Mills. I work on fisheries sustainability and nutrition with Worldfish and have coordinated this uh, incredible list of people you see in front of you now um, for the nutrition um, focus in IHH. In the years since the first hidden harvest report, the nutrition contributions of small scale fisheries has increasingly come into focus. This has been driven to varying degrees by the sustainable development goals, um, as well as the strong voice of fishers and their communities and organisations through the small scale fisheries guidelines. IHH provides a unique opportunity to illuminate this contribution and develop methods that can improve the incorporation of nutrition outcomes into fisheries management. One of the key methodological innovations employed in this study was predictive modeling of nutri nutri nutrient composition of fish. Conducting analysis of nutrient content of fish is expensive and quality data only exists for a very small number of species globally. However, using predictive modeling, we can use the characteristics of fish that we, we do know the nutrient composition of to predict nutrient values for any species. Uh, the nutrient values on the left hand side of the slide here show you um, the types of information on fish used for this modeling. As a spin off of this work, these models and, and related work, these models were incorporated into FishBase and can now be accessed um, for those interested in using them in management or in research. Using the detailed landings data from the IHH country case studies, we looked at the relative nutrition value of different fish groups. We found that while all fish provide a good diversity of macro and micronutrients, there were substantial differences and some absolute hero species. This graph shows the potential contribution of a 100 gram serving of fish flesh from each group to the recommended nutrient intakes of the six nutrients shown here to women of reproductive age. The longest bars here representing the most nutritious fish are small fish, both for marine and inland fisheries, and most frequently they are pelagic, so they live in midwater. These are also often the most affordable and available fish to rural populations. We applied these predicted, predicted nutrient values to the IHH regional extrapo extrapolations for small scale fisheries catches to estimate regional nutrient yields. Direct nutrient yield numbers are difficult to understand, so we express them here as the numbers of people from whom small scale fisheries could meet recommended nutrient intakes. In this case, it's for adult women. So omega-3 fatty acids, um, they're important for brain development and growth in infants and for a number of things, including um, protection against heart disease in adults. And they're only available from a very limited number of uh, types of foods. So um, we look at their contribution to a mixed diet. And in this case, we're looking at um, omega-3 fatty acids contributing 50% of the recommended daily intake. And the numbers here are 150 million women in Africa and 773 million women in Asia. Um, so similarly, the total nutrient yield from small scale fisheries landings 
um, could provide 20% of the recommended daily intake across four of the most abundant nutrients, namely calcium, selenium, zinc, and omega-3s, to 137 million women in Africa and 271 million women in Asia. In addition to this modeling approach, the IHH team worked with country case study teams to identify high quality data on nutrient outcomes from small scale fisheries. This type of data were rare. In a few data bright spots, we undertook in-depth analysis to answer the questions about who benefits from the nutrition value of small scale fisheries. For example, in Zambia, we were able to use national scale consumption survey data to show that fish are particularly important for maintaining dietary diversity among Zambian children. As shown here, only 18% of children showed adequate dietary diversity defined as consuming five or more uh, food groups in a meal. Meat was particularly important in driving this diversity. Uh, that's meat or fish, f flesh foods. And among these flesh foods, 58% of the meat consumed by children was fish. This reinforces the critical nature of fish, and in this, and this case, inland fisheries, small scale fisheries, in supporting positive nutrition outcomes for vulnerable groups. So you can see that small scale fish from small fish from small scale fisheries are often particularly important for nutrition that the fish from small scale fisheries have the potential to make considerable contributions to nutrition, even at uh, national and regional scales, and that fish can be very important in the diets of vulnerable rural population groups, and notably here children. Um, there, there's more in the chapter, and um, this includes information on um, food safety um, and issues around the importance of small scale fisheries in the first 1000 days of life. And of course, how data on better nutrition can be incorporated in small scale fisheries management. To maintain and build these critical nutrition functions of small scale fisheries, reforms are needed that put nutrition outcomes squarely in the center of management approaches. This is only possible when people centered human rights approaches to management can be implemented. And here I will hand over to Javier Becerto to bring some of the highlights from the governance research in IHH into focus. Thank you. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. My name is Javier Basurto. I'm one of the co-principal investigators of the IHH Research Initiative and led the work related to governance with the support of an excellent group of colleagues and students. All of the contributions you just heard about are embedded in a huge diversity of governance systems around the world. Here, we provide a first synthesis of the patterns emerging from the study of hundreds of small scale fisheries around the world. I focus on key messages related to the contributions of fishing organizations, the status of co-management, and the policy level of influence of co-management. Regarding fishing organizations, we created a database of more than 700 fishing organizations of different types. About 400 of them are producer organizations, represented by the red dots in the map. And I am focusing on those here. We did a study of the goals of those fishing organizations and we compare them to the themes of the small scale fisheries guidelines. Not surprisingly, we found that practically all organizations are expressing goals related to harvesting and sustainable fisheries management. What's more interesting perhaps and less expected was that 60% of those organizations also expressed goals related to human well-being, whether it was labor rights, food security, or human and environmental health. So three points emerge from this analysis. One is that indeed there is high alignment between the goals of fishers and the goals of the small scale fisheries guidelines, which shouldn't be surprising because the guidelines were the result of an extensive consultation process and therefore should be an expression of fishers' aspirations. Two is that fishers see high compatibility between sustainable fisheries management and human well-being. And three, and perhaps most relevant, is that fishers see themselves as active contributors to the implementation of the small scale fisheries guidelines and not passive recipients of state action. The second study was related to the global status of co-management. 
That study was made possible because we were able to link policies with the amount of catch that those policies govern. And that way we were able to get a sense of the relevance or the importance of those policies in terms of the catch each policy influenced. In this case, it was the amount of catch under co-management provisions. And so for 55% of the global small scale fisheries catch, we were able to determine that for every 10 metric tons, there is formal co-management provisions in four of them. And for two tons, there is the perception by experts that there is high participation of fishers. In other words, for every 10 tons, there is four for which there is formally co-management provisions in place and two, two tons for, for which implementation is thought to be happening on the ground. Now, we disaggregated the data by world regions and we see that Africa shows the highest gap between catch with co-management provisions and catch with high engagement in co-management or implementation on the ground. The third study focused on finding which policy supported most co-management. At the national level, we see the same proportion that I described before. Same at the subnational level. Now, the different sizes of fish is to remind us that more catch is under the influence of national level policies. At the local level, we see that this proportion flips. There are many more policies with formal co-management provisions and higher perception of implementation of co-management on the ground. So the lessons that emerge from this analysis are the following. We see evidence that fishers are active contributors to the implementation of the guidelines. Co-management is on the rise worldwide, compared especially to 30 years ago. However, much more remains to be done to turn what is in writing to implementation on the ground. Most co-management comes from local level policies, while national level policies often do not include co-management provisions. So a better alignment is needed between national and local level policies in terms of co-management. This is important because facilitating the participation of fishers in decision-making processes at the local level as well as the national level is key to strengthen the implementation of the small scale fisheries guidelines. And strengthening the implementation of the guidelines in turn is key to catalyze the numerous contributions that small scale fisheries make to sustainable development, as you have heard and seen throughout this presentation. Other analysis included in the governance chapter which I have no time to present today, are shown in this slide. In closing, findings from the governance chapter indicate that progress has been made, yet more work remains to be done to increase the participation of fishers, which is needed to realize the interlinked contributions small-scale fisheries can make to sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, colleagues, for these um, very interesting uh, findings. Um, I'm sure um, there is uh, more to tell, so please, um, all webinar participants, don't hesitate to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I believe we should have a last uh, summary slide just to give a, a quick overview of, of the key findings. There we are. So I just wanted to say um, a couple of words then to summarize what my colleagues have been talking about, um, or in more in a way of, of showing the, the connections between the different thematic areas. So what you see on the screen now are some of the key findings that have just been um, explained to us. And uh, these are examples of the many connections between the different aspects of small scale fisheries. And it's important to have all these different pieces to fully understand the narrative of small scale fisheries. Um, so in the follow up to this um, um, webinar on key findings, when we continue to explore 
the, um, the findings for the final report. These are some of the connections that we want to look more into. And um, this would be important to explore these to fully understand Mosque fisheries and to um, shape policy recommendations um, that the IHH report will include when it's launched next year. Um, during the presentations, we have had some questions coming in. And as I said, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to put more of those. Um, and we will hear from the presenters um, on these questions. I um, think I would like to start with a question to Mar of a more general nature. And uh, that is um, about the challenges in the IHH study and whether um, you feel we have been able to discover the unhidden or if there were difficulties in, in doing this and how far we got. Mar, would you like to comment on this, please? Yes, thank you, Lena. Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, we all know small scale fisheries are complex, they're diverse and they're not occurring in isolated or remote areas. And we know that small scale fisheries in different places may not have the same resources dedicated to information collection. So even so, um, we think that there's a surprising amount of information that can be uncovered at the national level um, that doesn't always cure it or doesn't always get analyzed in a way that can be used into national reporting or even for management purposes. We think that with our study, we uncovered the bulk of the small scale marine fishery catch, but perhaps not less so for the inland fisheries, especially for seasonal food fisheries and gleaning. We were um, struggling to, to find um, that information. Although the case study experts in each country um, were able to track existing data down, it's still clear that there remains more to know and, and there's still information um, that remains elusive on the most dispersed, dispersed and small, small scale fisheries activities. And this requires a specific focused information gathering effort. Many thanks, Mar, for those clarifications. Um, another um, sort of basic question is um, about the dif difference between small scale fisheries and artisanal fisheries. And um, I was also wondering um, if, Simon, you could tell us a bit about how the definition of small scale fisheries impacted the estimated the, the final catch figures. Thank you, Lena. Um, the definition of small scale fisheries, as we mentioned, uh, relied on country case study authors to uh, use prevailing national um, uh, definitions. But when we cross check this with um, uh, uh, our FAO data, when we cross check those definitions using the characterization matrix, we found that the majority of those fisheries identified as small scale fisheries fell into a band of uh, fishing characteristics that we would let's say naturally uh, assumed to be small scale fisheries. There was a small group at the top end that seemed to be rather large scale or rather organized, rather, rather uh, developed. This group um, still are considered to be small scale fisheries, but uh, uh, they would perhaps in some cases uh, be considered by other parts of the world to be rather large scale. Uh, the amount of catch that was attributed to this group was rather low. So we're still pretty confident that the the values that we have here attributed to global SSF are really representative of, of world small scale fisheries catch. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Simon. Um, we have a question today with regard to nutrition. Um, and you did well to um, give some numbers for Africa and Asia on the number of people that small scale fisheries could contribute to nutrition wise. And wonder if you had similar work um, on a similar estimate for Oceania and the Americas. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Thank you for the question. Yes, we do indeed. Um, obviously, within a within a small uh, a compact seminar like this, there's uh, limited capacity to give all the results. So I pulled them out. Um, ad admittedly, Asia and Africa are the uh, regions where the contribution is greatest. Oceania, of course, you have. If you want to look at it at a regional level, 
you have things diluted by uh, the Australian population and the inland Papua New Guinean population. Um, so um, yeah, yes, we do have we do have numbers for Oceania. Um, we have we can also go below regions in some cases. Um, that, but the analysis has been done on regions globally. Um, and as, as I pointed out, um, where, where you have catch data, the, the tools are now available through FishBase to, um, a, as a fairly simple spreadsheet process, do your own uh, calculations on the nutrition potential of catches. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave, for that explanation. Um, we have another uh, question from Mar, um, and that is about whether the research is uh, can be reproduced at national and local um, at local scales. Yes, thanks, Lena. Uh, great question. And yeah, uh, the answer is yes. The the a very important aspect of the IHH methodology was to have a, a protocol that could be applied in any country and at different scales. Of course, our goal with IHH was to be able to produce first estimates of these key indicators at the national level that we could then use to produce global estimates. But the approach can be applied at subnational and local levels as well. Um, the methodology was designed to be flexible so that different countries who undoubtedly will have different national reporting systems and different data collection systems in place can still adapt it and apply it to compile the minimum information necessary that we needed to estimate these key indicators. Uh, a huge component of our protocol was that we worked very closely with each country team to ensure that they were able to overcome any struggles or obstacles um, to compile the information. But, but the protocol itself is, is comprehensive, is complete. There's multiple options and suggestions that our um, experts were able to take so that we could get, like I said, the minimum amount of information necessary to get key indicator estimates. So um, I think it can be used um, for benchmarking for sure. Thank you very much, Mar. That sounds like there's some uh, very exciting opportunities for the future there. Um, but Simon, so far, they had the, the key findings, uh, particularly those um, that were on topics that have been studied before, how do they compare to, to previous uh, estimates? For example, production and employment values, etc. Thanks, Ina. Um, without having those numbers at my fingertips, um, but based on the fact that we did conduct some triangulation and comparisons, um, we could we 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 found that there was um, very very good alignment with previous studies. Uh, the levels of catches might uh, differ a little bit. We found perhaps um, a little bit less than some previous studies in terms of total catch. Uh, employment, uh, I think we are probably finding more. And a, a lot of this is to do with some of the, the very uh, clever modeling that has been done using labor force surveys and extrapolations that's allowed us to tease out uh, part-time and occasional work in fisheries that otherwise might not have been captured by other studies. Uh, importantly, a lot of what's come out of this IHH are, going, are metrics that simply haven't been done before. And so this is what's so exciting about the IHH study is that we're able to go over some of the old figures, but also we're digging up a lot of new stuff and we're able to put this together to give us a much more rounded perspective of uh, small scale fisheries globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I, um, so um, I wonder, you touched on this now, but how does this um, compare to, to FEO data that we, um, we have the, the FEO database based on official statistics? I don't know if you could say a few more words on that. Uh, okay, the, um, the important thing to, to realize is that the IHH study uh, was intended to try to uh, uh, uncover and to reveal the amount of small scale fisheries catch uh, in um, globally. Now we're able to do that. We're able to show how much catch there is. Now the FAO statistics for fisheries catch does not separate into small scale fisheries and large scale fisheries. It just takes it as national catches. So the proportion of catch that we have sits within the total global catch. Now the FAO statistic 
is about 92.1 million tons globally. And we found 37 million tons or 40% as uh, small scale fisheries. We're very comfortable that this represents a, a credible figure. And the issue of whether or not that there is a, a big additional increment there that might somehow increase the total global figure, we are not at, in, in a position to really indicate that but we are relatively comfortable by the triangulation that we've done that this figure is robust and that we can say that, that give or take, uh, the total global figure hasn't changed very much, but that we are now much more confident about how much of the world's fish comes from small scale fisheries. Uh, in terms of employment, we collect employment figures, but we've never had such a detailed look at small scale fisheries employment. And again, employment in large scale sector and small scale sector, we do have some disaggregated data at that, but the country submission of this data is very patchy. So we don't produce very robust uh, uh, global employment data sets for, for fisheries employment. Uh, this is a very, very good first step and also shown us some great tools about how we can try to uh, validate uh, these kind of information uh, at country level. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we have another question with regard to nutrition for Dave. Um, how much variation do you think there is in nutrition value within a species uh, between different places? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, so as it is now, um, as I think I said, we're kind of scrabbling for data. So there's not a lot of analysis out there. Um, and there's certainly not a lot to model that that variation based on sort of within species. But uh, interestingly, there, there are significant um, in, uh, factors in the model, which, you know, they vary geography, uh, latitude, longitude, uh, depth, and therefore uh, thermal influence, um, all, very, all are considerable drivers of nutrient uh, quality of fish. So. Uh, it's expected you would see changes within species as well. I know there's been some analysis of this for limited numbers of species, and obviously there's climate change um, implications there as well. But within the approach we've used here, uh, we just haven't had the data that is analysed um, at the sort of analytical level with um, licensed laboratories and so on to give us the quality of data we need for that analysis. But certainly uh, fascinating question, and we're working towards it. That's uh, great to hear. Uh, let's move a bit on to um, the economic aspects. Um, Nicole, we have a question here uh, for you. Um, you mentioned that um, the total uh, revenue from, SS, uh, from small scale fisheries correspond to 77 billion. Um, but do you have any uh, information on the per capita revenue? Um, for example, household income, wages, etc., and how that would compare to national averages. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for that question. Um, for, for this study, we have focused on generating these global aggregates for the moment. So, so um, this is why we have presented the, the global revenue um, that we shared with you in the presentation. We have much more data in the database. Um, what you have seen, the analysis that you have seen, the numbers you have seen are just the tip of the iceberg of the, of the data that we have collected uh, through these 58 country and, and territory case studies. Um, we do have more data, for example, on, on wages, on, on labor um, in that data set. For, for this study, we haven't dig down at that level, but um, as we said in the beginning, we see the study being part of what we call the IHH initiative which will continue. So this study is but one part of this overall initiative. So we will look into additional secondary publications where we'll be able to do, um, dig deeper into, for example, these aspects of, of um, income and wage distribution at the household level much, much further in the future. So for now, um, this study focused at the global level, but, but we really look forward also to working with others hopefully present here today um, to join us to, to further harmonize the data we have, clean it and, and use it to, to get to these additional uh, pieces of information that really, really will help us to, to understand small scale fisheries in a, in a much more granular way. Thank you, Lena. 
Thanks, Nicole. Um, so there is more to come and more work to be done. Um, I have another question about uh, comparisons, and this is now comparing back to earlier work. And uh, I wonder, Danica, if you could say something about how the gender data compared to the findings of the Hidden Harvest report from 2012, uh, from the, uh, yeah, the 2012 report. And are more sure. or less women estimated to participate in the different steps of the value chain? Thank you. Um, so I was just looking up the old report and Dave Mills might be able to, to give you more details on that. Um, so in the old report, uh, about 37 million women were estimated to participate and that came up to 47% of the total estimate. Um, and this time around, uh, the number was 40 million women were estimated and that came up to about 39% um, of the total estimate. So ostensibly the number has gone down. Um, while we think that this analysis is much more robust than the last one, building off the last one, um, obviously we also know that there are some really important data gaps that have not yet been able to be addressed. Like Mar was saying, um, there was uh, underestimation of, of gleaning, um, also underestimation um, of certain types of, of, of labors that, um, uh, that women tend to dominate. So uh, it's a start. Um, but yeah, so there, there are differences and that may be due to, to differences in the, in the data used, um, but we don't think it's the final answer. Can I just break protocol and jump in here? <laughs> to, please, to please. Data. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, ab ab so as someone who was involved intimately in the first Hidden Harvest report, I could, could, couldn't agree more. Um, much more robust approach this time around. Um, the numbers have gone up, the percentage has gone down. So there was a lot missed in terms of employment last time. And so, yeah, the percentage shifts this time. But um, yeah, I think I think last time served a purpose. It had a far lower number of case studies. And so the basis for um, sort of global figures was, was weaker. Um, and I think that we're definitely moving in the right direction here. And could I, I just want to add to uh, Dr. Mills, the process of going through this this illuminating hidden harvest also pointed to where those gaps were and where we can really go next. And so it's super exciting um, to, to see where where the next steps are going to be. Thank you very much, both of you, for that. Um, there was another part of that question um, comparing to the last hidden harvest, and that had to do with catch. and. I would maybe like to combine that uh, with a question for Simon. Um, if you want to say something comparing also back to the 2012 hidden harvest and the estimates of inland catch, um, especially for Africa. And um, this, the question also um, uh, is on if you can distinguish between the contribution of inland fisheries between lakes and reser reservoirs on one hand and rivers and floodplains on the other. Simon, do you think you could? Um... Yeah, OK. Uh, I've actually just typed, uh, typed an answer to that one. Um, the, this, this study, we specifically asked the case study authors to indicate uh, the, the ecosystem type that the fish were coming from. So they were able to respond that these fisheries were uh, lake type fisheries or floodplain or river type fisheries. Uh, so we do have that information and we can uh, cut the data according to that. Uh, having said that, uh, the large lake fisheries in Africa in particular are very concentrated fisheries and tend to be better studied than floodplain fisheries or riverine fisheries. That means that we don't necessarily have access to such good quality data from these other types of, of fishery. And I would say overall, we got a higher representation from large lakes, for example, and more concentrated lake type fisheries. So this is just another example of those uh, limitations that all studies have, that we can't get down to the very, very granular level where we have the most dispersed forms of small scale fishing. And I think Danica just mentioned this, the gleaning fisheries, the very seasonal foot fisheries, those fisheries that are, are just happening at a very, very, very diffuse and dispersed level. We really still need to try to dig into that, particularly to get an idea of how much more catch is out there uh, that is not being picked up. We, we know that some, but uh, whether or not it's a an absolute mountain of catch, we're not so sure. We're, we're fairly confident it's not as substantial as uh, 
as has been indicated by some previous estimates that have used quite extravagant extrapolations. But it's certainly not insignificant. And, and at the household level, it is important for nutrition. Never forget that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Simon. Um, let's um, move um, and look a bit um, forward and um, uh, the, the take a question on the policy on this. And Nicole, do you think you could um, um, tell us a bit about if there's a plan or how um, you um, think to involve policymakers in uh, highlighting the importance of small scale fisheries based on on these uh, results of the of the uh, IHH, for example, um, bringing co-management to national policies or or other aspects that you think could be coming out of this as recommendations. Yeah, thank you for for this question, which obviously is very relevant because um, again we see the study as a starting point for real change on the ground. Um, and obviously the involvement of policymakers in this is, is fundamental so that these findings are taken up and are really informing policy in the future. Um, we, we can give one example um, on, how, on how that may look. Um, through our colleagues here from World Fish, who may want to compliment, um, we have engaged, for example, in Zambia and already also doing this in Malawi, where we have worked with uh, colleagues from the government on, on validating the findings from the study and, and preparing policy briefs in a participatory way so that there's really an uptake of those findings and there's really um, a way to, to hand over the ownership of this to, to the policy makers. Um, so that is obviously one, one important step, the sharing of these findings, the discussion of these findings with the, with the, um, uh, with the policy makers at the national level. And that would be a fundamental uh, part of of the follow-up activities that we will have uh, after after we conclude the study, the the so to say the the rollout, what we call the rollout of um, of the study in the future, and that will also include obviously um, going into specific issues such as core management. It will depend on the individual context of the country where priorities will sit, um, but we will definitely uh, aim to work in improving capacities for data collection, data analysis, and then. Uh, operationalizing the, the related findings, for example, in relation to co-management. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, a follow-up question uh, to that. Is there um, um, a plan or is there thinking um, of asking countries to, in the future, um, distinguish between catches between small-scale and large-scale fisheries? Is this something that would be desirable for the future? Yes, um, this distinction is, is, is quite important. And I think we can see from the work that we have done um, that it, it adds value. It adds value to the information that is already uh, collected in countries to provide a better understanding of the nature of the fishery in a country, um, because that will also help understand how the different types of fisheries in a country align or can contribute to different policies or policy objectives or to the achievement of, of other internationally agreed uh, goals and commitments. So we from the FAO side for, for certain will help countries or work with countries in order to better develop that distinction in the future. Um, for example, something we haven't presented, but I think I saw a question in, in, in that uh, also coming in the chat. Um, is the contribution of small scale fisheries to trade. Um, I said that in the, in the economics cluster, for example, we also tried to work in that direction because currently available trade figures, for example, do not distinguish whether aquatic food is coming from aquaculture, from uh, large scale fisheries or from small scale fisheries. But it is certainly important also to understand what is happening there. So by having the breakdown of the data into the different subset sectors, we will have a better opportunity to then match the support in terms of policies uh, and other measures to those sectors in relation to the policy objectives that, that they are serving. Thank you, Nicole. 
Um, let's go back a little bit to the approach and the method. Um, we have another question from Mar, um, and that is, how did you aggregate the information from 58 diverse case studies into the global summary statistics? What were the main challenges you faced and how did you overcome those? Yeah, thanks, Lena. Um, yeah, this was quite a, a, a task. Um, so like I said earlier, um, the first part of it was, you know, monitoring every case study as it was being um, carried out, making sure that, uh, that the key components were, were obtained from each case study. We asked for a lot of information, but we really, you know, in the end, we were really looking for specific, very key information uh, data on indicators um, that we could then um, use to, to produce the global figures. So for some of these, like, like we saw in catch and employment, uh, we developed um, extrapolation methodologies that took into account um, additional um, predictor variables that would help us um, estimate these global figures. Um, it was impossible for all of the indicators, but for the key ones, that's how we did it. Uh, the biggest challenges were, you know, being able to find enough um, coverage, I would say, to make sure that we were really, um, for each country that we were using in this extrapolation, that we were um, covering 100% um, or as close as possible to 100% of the country's um, uh, catch or employment, for example. Um, that was one, uh, one of the main challenges because it's, it's difficult to know. Another thing we did um, as part of the, of the approach, the methodology itself, we were screening very carefully, especially for these key indicators. We were scrutinizing it for lack of a better word. We were very careful in making sure that we understood every single aspect of the data we were provided up to the data point. Uh, we checked um, heavily for um, diagnostics on the data, detection of outliers. Um, we were really, really um, strict about making sure we understood every aspect of the data we were being provided with to make sure that it, it was you know, accurate and robust enough to be used for these global extrapolation methodologies. So that was one of the, the biggest um, hurdles. Um, and we had a, a wonderful team of uh, what we call the data screeners who were responsible for um, keeping track of, of all these different data sets that were coming in. Um, and then once we had every case study um, in place, finalized, um, checked, verified, uh, we started compiling them and getting them ready into a form that we could use for the estimation of the global figures. So that's, that was the case for the key estimates um, at the global level. Thank you, Mar. Um, we have another question here on um, if um, in the, all this work, if we were able to, were you able to define the main challenges um, that face uh, small scale fisheries in different parts of the world? And um, well, what the main challenges are now and also what the future looks like? Um, I don't know if um, Simon or any other other colleague would like to try to answer that. Okay, um, I'm hoping that my colleagues will jump in, but uh, I can have a start at it. Uh, main challenges for the future. This study has taken us um, at least four years to go from, uh, or five years even, to go from sort of inception to, to coming out with results. Um, hopefully we won't be so slow next time around, uh, but we certainly are already finding that there is a, plenty of, of grounds to dive deeper into country level. As with all studies, we, we're, we are revealing so many interesting things that, uh, that, that raise as many questions as they answer. And certainly uh, there is uh, a need now for us to work much more closely with countries to help them understand their particular small scale fishery context and start to look at how do we turn this from a kind of general global study to raise awareness and understanding down to real concrete country actions that translate into policy, improvement of conditions for small scale fishers, uh, regulatory aspects, the whole range of, um, of, of policy considerations, um, as well as uh, nutrition and, and, and livelihoods related aspects too, that, that will enable countries to sustain and support their and secure their small scale fishery sector in line with the voluntary guidelines on SSF. I don't know if any colleagues want to add to that. 
Thanks, Emma. I think maybe Nicole could come in. Um, there was a part of the IHA that also looked a bit of yep. um, drivers for, of, of change. So Nicole, please, if you have some comments. Um, yes, exactly. You, you mentioned that already, uh, Lena. So, so one of the things we asked also um, in the country case studies um, was to rank the importance of 13 pre-selected drivers of change. Um, so obviously that has some limitations because we had pre-identified those drivers, but I think um, there's still some value in understanding some of the main challenges um, that, are, that are occurring in, in small-scale fisheries across the world. And, and those drivers obviously included some of the obvious one like, like fishing pressure, resource scarcity, climate change, um, habitat degradation, but also other aspects like gender equality. Um, so, so we also consider the, the outcomes of this assessment, which obviously um, is based on the expert opinion from the country case study authors, but, but this will be um, uh, at least giving us uh, an indication towards some of the main challenges that have been identified uh, by these, by these uh, experts in the countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. And I think on that note, uh, we need to close this um, uh, Q&A session. Um, I would like to thank um, all participants for very insightful questions and also, of course, my colleagues for all their, their answers. Um, as we are getting closer towards the end of this uh, webinar as well, I would now like to hand over to Manuel Barrancha, the Director of Fisheries and Aquaculture Division of FEO, to give some closing remarks. Over to you, Manuel. Thank you, Lina. And, and thank you all for joining us for this sneak preview of the key findings of the IHH study. Uh, just by monitoring the chat and the Q&A of this event, I can see that the audience has been as excited and inspired by the results of this study as I have. Well done, IHA team. And what a week we have had. On Friday, the FAO launched the 2022 International Year of Small Scale Fisheries and Aquaculture. Yesterday, we celebrated World Fisheries Day with events all over the world. And today, we have this sneak preview of the IHA study. The findings shared today confirmed and quantify the essential contribution of small scale fisheries for sustainable development in relation to livelihoods, to food security and nutrition, and to resources sustainability. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the over 800 experts behind this study. They have contributed in very many ways, for example, by compiling information from the 58 country and territory studies, or as members of the technical advisory group, as gender advisors, and of course, the colleagues from the IHA partner organizations, Wellfish and Duke University. The credibility of studies like this one relies on the credibility and diversity of its contributors and their institutions. And of course, we thank the governments of Norway and Sweden and Oak Foundation for the funding support without which this study could not have been possible. These collective efforts have allowed us to provide updated and new global reference figures for small scale fisheries for the first time since the release of the 2012 Hidden Harvest Report. Furthermore, the new figures provide unprecedented resolution. The study confirms the importance of transcending individual disciplines to integrate different policy domains and sources of information to bring new understandings of the importance of small-scale fisheries. For example, the incorporation of nutrition and governance, which had not been covered in the previous Hidden Harvest Report, are examples of this integrated approach. At the same time, the study largely validates FAO official fisheries data currently available. But despite the deep dives for the country case studies, it has become clear that some data were not or not entirely available, for example, on inland fisheries or on food fishes in remote areas. And hence, a lot still remains hidden, as Simon Feinsmith uh, answered in one of the questions. We therefore see this IHA study as an important step in a broader global initiative to further improve methods and capacities to collect, to analyze, and to use data and information on small-scale fisheries and aquaculture as a basis for sound and inclusive policymaking and resource governance, and also as a source of evidence on the importance of this subsector in food and livelihood security dialogues. We also hope that partnerships around the project will continue to grow 
and we hope that we can count on your collaboration moving forward. Make no mistake, each one of the partners has learned an awful lot from each other during this study and from the study itself, and this momentum must be harnessed and steered. To reiterate the point, this is not the end. It is just the point in the story where you turn the page. And the new page will be the launch of the full report in early 2022 during the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. There will be much more to share about the methods. We will go deeper into the findings and implications and share recommendations and next steps. So stay tuned, it's going to be a bestseller. Until then, thank you to the speakers for their exciting and insightful presentations and to all of you for your attention. Over to you, Lina. Thank you very much, Manuel. Uh, we have a lot to look forward to. Um, I would like to, to thank everybody who joined this um, webinar uh, today and for their contribution to this um, robust discussion we have had. Um, as I mentioned already, um, with regard to questions, uh, we um, will attempt to put together a Q&A document that includes answers to questions that may not have been answered uh, so far, and uh, also a brief uh, that we put on the IHH uh, website soon. Um, in the meantime, if you have any further questions, please email them to the IHH team. Um, an email address will be posted in the chat. Um, and also the, um, the website um, for the IHH where, where uh, the information will be posted. Um, this webinar will be happening again at uh, 4 p.m. this afternoon, Central European time, uh, to allow for colleagues in other time zones to, to also um, share, um, share these findings. Um, and we uh, hope then that you will join us next year for the full launch of the IHH report, during which more information on the methods along with the full findings and policy recommendations um, will be shared. Those recommendations we expect will point to action that we all as government officials, donors, researchers and civil society can take to better achieve shared goals for small scale fisheries. But we already now can start thinking about what is needed with regard to improving data collection, analysis, and capacity development to enhance our knowledge. We have had this sneak preview on some of the findings, and um, it's, of course, a basis to start thinking along these lines and to um, using these findings for further research and thinking of um, actions. Together, we can take important steps towards creating the right environment to ensure that small scale fisheries are sustainable, equitable, and inclusive, and contribute to sustainable development. Last but not least, I'd like to mention again the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture uh, 2022, and invite you all to celebrate this year as an opportunity for sharing experiences and learning from one another. Thank you very much and looking forward to being in touch again.